and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Marco Vespignani, who will be talking to us about supplements for MS and what you need to know about them. After a presentation from the doctor, we'll open it up to your questions and comments. And now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Dr. Marco Vespignani is a neuropathic doctor licensed in Washington and California. He is currently the medical director at Seattle Integrative Medicine, a private group clinic in Seattle. He focuses his clinical care on patients experiencing autoimmune, neurodegenerative, and complex pain syndromes. In addition, he is an adjunct faculty member at Vassar University, where he re received his medical training. He has written articles and contributed to an integrative neurology textbook and published in 2020. Dr. Marco is also an experienced public speaker. Having lectured throughout three states, he has called home, Washington, California, and Hawaii. So now I'm delighted to introduce um, Marco. I'm, I'm so thankful that you're here with us today. We're very pleased to have you present this wonderful topic and I'm gonna turn it over to you. That's great. Thank, thank you so much, Deborah. I've always liked working with the MS Foundation. It's really been fun for me um, over the years and chances to do things like this. So, you know, as, as you and I talked, you know, there's kind of the option of, of slides and, and live kind of interactive. And so what I've tried to do is really put together a, a fairly simple slideshow just in the sense of keeping me on topic. But hopefully this will be uh, information that, that the viewers haven't seen before or at least kind of explain in a different way. So I'm gonna go ahead and start that here. So hopefully everyone get a good view of that and still, still see me there in the corner. Um, so I tried to think about like what, what you need to know with MS and supplements, what, what's kind of the, the overall sense of, of the playing field as a whole. So that's my, my goal today. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Marco Vespignani. I'm, I'm a naturopathic doctor. So that's a, a training in, um, you know, it's a, it's a post graduate. So I went to school uh, in biology at University of Hawaii and so received my bachelor's and then four years of, of med school and then a residency. Um, and so that was at Bastier. And then since 2010, um, I've run a practice called Seattle Integrative Medicine, which has a number of other doctors who focus in, in various disciplines, Parkinson's, Women Health and otherwise. And so that's, uh, I'm interested in neurology. I spent years uh, working in that field. And so that's kind of where I'm, I'm drawn to. So uh, my dad, uh, you may be able to tell from my name, Marco Vespignani, my dad's an immigrant from, from uh, Italy. And so for him, languages were always interesting and, and the contract English, so English as it's written in a contract is always his favorite, like if he could understand that, that was to him kind of proof that he'd made it, right? And so I grew up with the word legalese, he loved the legalese. And so this is my uh, tribute to him there. These are the legalese of kind of what we'll be talking about today. So first, I am a licensed naturopathic doctor. I do have a license to practice medicine, but it is only in Washington, California. Naturopathic medicine is licensed state by state. So depending on where you're listening from, you know, there may not be a naturopathic doctor who could, you know, treat you or diagnose you based on kind of uh, the, the laws of the state there. And, you know, I am a doctor, but I'm not your doctor. So anything that we kind of talk about today is, is not necessarily specific to you. It's, it's generalizations about supplements and MS, my experience and otherwise. So if you're looking to act on any of this information, it's important that you at least consult with someone who is your care provider and can guide you in the right direction. And if for some reason they wanted to reach out directly to me, I'm happy to, to communicate in that way with another provider. I'm also not a neurologist. I just play one on the internet. It's kind of that takeoff from the, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. So my experience is in neurology, but I am not a board certified neurologist and I have great respect for uh, board certified neurologists and I've worked closely with them throughout my career. Um, certainly here in Seattle, names you might know, Dr. Bowen, Dr. Keita, um, you know, Dr. Thrower. These are all people that, that I'm on a you know, more or less first name basis with. So that's the, that's the specifics of, of my licensure and my practice. The legalese of the supplement industry 
It's important to recognize that a supplement is, is a kind of different animal in that it's a non FDA approved, something called GRASS, which stands for generally recognized as safe. Now that means that either through some kinds of animal or human studies, this, this substance has been defined as safe, or there's thousands or hundreds of years of experience with this you know, individual thing that shows that it's not harmful, at least in kind of normal usage. And so a grass substance, GRAS, is, is an important part of the, the supplement world, right? So these are, these are things that are recognized as safe. It's also something that has not been proven to treat or manage a particular disease. So supplements are not treatments per se. Um, and that's an important thing. And that's, that's kind of around this label. Labels in, in from a medicine standpoint are an important thing. You may hear, you know, that drug is used off label for this or the label claims or label use. And so the label of a particular product is a very important legal designation. Um, and so it's important in medicine, it's important in law. So if something is you know, FDA approved to treat MS, that means that it has a label that essentially says this is used for MS. And so that would be something like Copaxone or something like you know, uh, Vermu um, uh, uh, the new Tecfidera, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the the Vumerity, right? So that's the, the more recent approval of, of a, a, a compound that's very similar to Tecfidera. Right? And so essentially, if this product says it treats something, it better be provable. And so when it comes to supplements, because they're not regulated by the FDA, they fall into a different designation legally. And so in 1994, there was some legislation put through uh, Congress that's called the Deshay Act, which is the Dietary Supplement and Health and Education Act. And so the attempt here was to create some consumer protection so that if there's something that's on a shelf that has a label on it, there better be proof that what's in that container is the same thing as what's written on that label. And so it, it fell short of the mark of saying that supplements can treat a particular condition but it landed squarely on the idea that you shouldn't be buying something and not know what it is, right? And I think that's a, a pretty fair uh, uh, expectation from, for a consumer. And so that means that the label is very important, you know, that, that if it says there's 500 milligrams of ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, then it better be in there. Um, because that label is saying that's there. And there's a law that says that if it's not the same thing as what's written on the outside, then, then you have you know, a claim as a consumer that this thing might, might create harm. So basically you can't you know, sell something and not have that thing actually be in there. And it's also important to know that label claims, things written on a label for a supplement can't, you know, say particular things you know label claims have to at least for supplements fall in the range of support enhance provide this is an essential part of x it needs to be some kind of a roundabout description as its role in in medicine or science or whatever uh it cannot say you know this supplement treats you know ms neuropathy right that is a claim. That is a claim for a particular condition, neuropathy, MS. And so that would mean the FDA has to be able to say, yeah, we did you know, 15 peer reviewed studies and we found that this dose of this treated this. And so then that actually becomes something like a medical food. Um, you know, an interesting, there's things that do both, right? There's something called pernicious anemia, which is a problem of B12 deficiency. And so B12 treats pernicious anemia. Um, and so you can get a prescription for cyanocobalamin as a, as a, you know, injection and inject that for the treatment of that condition. You don't necessarily see B12 on the shelf that says, you know, treats pernicious anemia, right? So, you know, some of these claims, there are things, you know, even L-carnitine, which is a, a, a kind of amino acid that, that can help with, uh, drugs that affect epilepsy. And so there may be people who have an L-carnitine deficiency. 
And so here's this levocarnitine, which is both a supplement and an actual FDA approved food um, for a particular condition or, or substance. So some things will cross the mark, but in general, a supplement cannot have a, a claim of treatment. Um, and, you know, it has to have what it says it has in it. Now there are some roundabouts, right? That, that you may open a, you know, a box of something and see on the, on the, you know, tiny print there that it has this much calcium, this much magnesium, and then, you know, 346 milligrams of the proprietary blend of, you know, this marshmallow root and this thing. And so it's a big paragraph of stuff and it just says 346 milligrams. So that means that, that that manufacturer has to state how much of their recipe is in there, this kind of 346 milligrams of stuff, but they're protected under their own you know, proprietary laws that say, we don't have to disclose this recipe of how much of each thing is in here. And so that might be a little bit confusing for some because you're looking at this and you're like, well, there's like all these individual herbs or individual supplements. And all I know is the total. I don't know what each thing is in there. So how do I compare these two products? And that's unfortunately something that you really can't, you know, get down into. The, the manufacturer will not disclose that recipe because they're protected there. Another thing that's really important on the labels is looking at, you know, who's testing this, right? How do they know that what's on the label is what's in the in the capsule and so typically you're going to see something like gmp and that just basically means that this product meant good manufacturing practices that that somebody came along and put a stamp on in there and said yeah there we didn't find very many rat hairs in this in this supplement or you know everyone that we looked at was wearing gloves you know there are other organizations the nsf which is your national science foundation you know, there's the USP, which is the US Pharmacopeia. You'll see those sometimes in things like a progesterone cream because progesterone is a hormone or maybe even like melatonin or something. So sometimes something has a, a pharmaceutical origin, but the dosage of it is small enough that it falls into the supplement category or it comes from a natural substance. And so basically the, the long and the short of it is that you're trying to find some kind of proof that that company has paid someone or someone has inspected them or something, right? Um, and so you may see something that says, you know, this was manufactured in an FDA approved laboratory. Well, that's kind of a funny little game, right? Because the lab is approved by the FDA, not the product, but they brought the product to the lab, had the lab analyze it and then send a sample in and, you know, verify. And so they say, well, we were, we were, you know, tested by the FDA and, and it's approved or whatever it might be. And that's, that's kind of a, a, a game of moving things around. Um, you will not find a supplement that has been approved by the FDA because once that happens, that becomes a medical food or a drug. And so that's a different thing entirely. A good example of this, if you're interested in kind of the, the nuts and bolts and details, there's a drug, food, supplement called Deplin. Deplin is a methylfolate. It's a form of folate that's just a very, you know, great form of it. It has this methylation in there. I'll talk about methylation in a bit. And so 7.2 milligrams of methylfolate is a dosage that has been used as an adjunctive for, you know, antidepressants. Uh, so if someone's on a, an SSRI, something like maybe, you know, Prozac or Lexapro or something, like that, and it doesn't seem to be working as well, that individual's provider may decide, well, we don't really want to add another drug to this, but if we add some methylfolate, your SSRI might work better. And so let's use Deplin, a drug that's actually just a high dose of a vitamin that you can get as a supplement in like one or three milligrams. But at 7.2 milligrams, it has been approved as a drug. So again, there's these kind of you know funny little designations where the same product might cross a line and then become a drug because it's been proven in some study to be used for this stuff. So that's, that's the, the legalese essentially, right? So now we get into more of the like, well, how does this even, 
affect my condition or or what is this you know what's the point of this right and so it's very common for me to have someone sit with me and say you know my neurologist my primary care that doesn't really matter you know what i eat or if i take any supplements they just really want me to make sure i take my my dmd that that it's most important to them that I'm on a medication and that I stay true to it. And, and that for the most part, what I eat or, you know, supplements that as long as I'm eating, I'm fine. And so why is that? What, you know, how come you're coming from a different direction there? And I think the first answer is, well, you know, that's, that's a valid point, right? That the, these studies were done on lots of people who did lots of different things in eight different ways and may or may not have taken supplements. And in the whole, it seemed like these medications helped slow progression. So they're coming from a place of the evidence they have, right? I also think, you know, when you're a hammer, things look like nails. And so if that's where they're coming from, they're not necessarily thinking about how the nervous system works as, you know, the cellular level, what kind of things might help a nerve to heal? What kind of things might bring down inflammation in the body on a lower level than something like a dose of solumedrol? You know, what, what can you do to kind of enhance the, the gentle function of the body over time versus these big hits of, of medications or something that might, might disrupt? And so that's really where my focus is, is what are the, the small changes that people can do every day that over a lifetime have a huge impact on how the body functions as opposed to these big hits of something you know in every six month a uh, dose of orcrevus that you know inhibits some part of the b cells and creates this change versus something that has a you know like omega-3s that slowly change the way cytokines are released in the body over time right and that in general the the therapies of DMT and DMDs are, are part of immunomodulation. The, the goal of these treatments is to shift the immune system, that, that you're trying to make it less aggressive or to change the way in which it, it identifies targets. And so that's an immunomodulatory approach to MS. You're, you're, you're treating the condition by changing the immune system in some way. And from my perspective, that is just one part of a, you know, MS treatment protocol, a very important part, but just one. And so again, with everything that I do, I am absolutely, there's nothing that I recommend or suggest or anything that goes counter to anything that a neurologist would suggest. Now they may think that some of my stuff is, you know, maybe overdone or there isn't enough research, but there isn't anything about my approach that goes counter to what the, the neurological community would like to do in, in treatment of MS. And so I kind of think of myself as an additive to all of this, What's an, a supplement to the supplements, right? So again, immunomodulation, and I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, how I see that and what are the specifics of the supplements that affect that and kind of how that fits in the larger tree of MS treatment. So, you know, do I need them? Like, what's even the point, right? And so it depends, right? It, everyone's doing their own thing. And so it's possible that someone is living a life that is, you know, functional enough, they're eating well enough, they're sleeping well enough, that everything is working really well, that supplements would have a minor impact on what already good things are going on. And it's really important to recognize that there isn't any supplement that can take the place of these really good lifestyle things, you know, a good diet, right? Often people are trying to supplement things to make up for what might be in their diet, things they may not like to eat or, or otherwise. Um, quality sleep, I'll talk more about this in a bit, but sleep is one of the most important things when you're dealing with a neurodegenerative condition that, that sleep is when the brain heals. And so if someone is not sleeping well, and often, you know, issues with pain, issues with, you know, problems around incontinence or bladder issues or, or other things, you know, that their the spasticity, there's all kinds of things that can impact a, a good night's sleep. And, and so that's an important thing to focus on as, as an individual who, who's dealing with MS. 
how do I improve my sleep? I think that that is, is, should be a primary goal, whether it be through, you know, making sure there's not sleep apnea or, you know, issues with, you know, waking up a lot through the night, not getting, you know, good enough depth of sleep. And unfortunately, a lot of sleep medications tend to have diminishing returns. There, there tends to be issues with the way the medications affect how people function and sleep. And so supplements become a really interesting place around sleep. And, and I'll talk about that. Um, activity, you know, there is no exercise pill. I really wish there was, but uh, it turns out you just have to try to move. Um, and then stress management, you know, how, how an individual deals with the stress of their environment, whatever that might be. Um, and so within that, there might be people who need support in different ways to achieve these levels of, you know, improving their diet, improving their sleep, you know, helping build muscle, you know, whatever that might be to kind of improve that process overall. So as I mentioned, uh, MS in my mind has, you know, four very clear pillars of management that, that when I'm thinking about how to uh, help my patients with MS, I'm always thinking about these four things and, and how, do I, how do I enhance each part of that? So first, you know, antioxidant, the, the oxidation is the process by which we break down, the process by which we age, right? Uh, oxidation is, is the internal rusting of the body. Now we use oxygen for, you know, our air to breathe, to, to burn fuel in our body. So there's no way to avoid oxidation. You know, oxygen is something that we have to take in and deal with. But the kind of breakdown of that oxygen, the, the release of those you know, you know, oxidizing chemicals is something that we have methods by which we can control. Perhaps some of you have heard of glutathione. Glutathione is one of the major antioxidants in the body. It's something that's made in the liver, it's made in the brain. And you know, glutathione is, is the kind of mother of all antioxidants as kind of a uh, but there's also antioxidant vitamins. There's uh, vitamin C or vitamin E. There's some other, you know, things like alpha lipoic acid. And so I, I have this stuff, you know, in other slides. So I'll, I'll go deeper into that. But the antioxidant pathway is important. Anti-inflammatory. Inflammation is the process by which autoimmune conditions develop. You, you have the immune system discover something, you know, often the immune system discovers something that you don't want to be there, you know, a virus, a, a bacteria, a cancer. And so you want to draw the immune system in and create inflammation, create oxidation and damage that so that you can get rid of it. In the case of, of autoimmune, that's a self protein. That's something that we have kind of within us that we should have. And now the immune system is there kind of wreaking havoc. And so if you can reduce inflammation, you can reduce some of the collateral damage, you can reduce some of the kind of extended periods of, of inflammation that can develop from an attack. Um, so making sure that there's good anti-inflammatory uh, process in there. Now, it's important to know that, you know, when someone's in a flare, solumedrol, which is, a, you know, a high dose of, of steroids that done on IV, um, is an extremely powerful anti-inflammatory. It can cross the blood-brain barrier and, and take care of that inflammation. So anti-inflammatories are used in, in the management, but they're not used in the long-term management. It, it's used for spikes. And, and you know, some of you may have been told, you know, we don't necessarily want to use solumenter all the time. There's a lot of problems that come from that, you know, and you know, diminishing returns with that as well. And so again, my strategy is what anti-inflammatory approaches can be done on a regular basis, maybe not nearly as strong, definitely not nearly as strong as something like solumedrol, but can kind of create a, a slow amount of anti-inflammatory activity over time. Um, and there's dietary changes that can do both of these, you know, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory things. Immunomodulation, that's got the star on it because that's what I was talking about with the, the DMD, DMTs, the, the, that is where this falls. And so as you can see, you know, if that's being taken care of by a conventional provider, then I can focus on the other three. Now I can suggest some things on that particular category, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't affect the rest of my treatment. 
And then the important thing that only recently have I been hearing in the in the conventional community, you know, when I started treating MS, you know, almost 20 years ago, no one talked about repair or remyelination or neuroregeneration. It was just kind of thought that, you know, you have a certain number of brain cells and that's kind of what you get. And when they're damaged, that's kind of how it is. And there you are. And now we know that there's a lot of uh, forces within the brain, within the nervous system that help to try to repair and heal. And so that's, that's again, where I try to put a lot of energy in because I feel like that's a place to focus, certainly for people who've been dealing with this condition for a while, because you need that hope. You know, it's, it's not just about slowing progression. It's about reversing if you can or improving. And I think what some people have seen with relapsing remitting is you get this burst of symptoms, you have this problem, and then your body heals. And, and so you don't have that same problem that you had, say, three or four months ago when, when the relapse first occurred. And so whatever that is, we want to really focus in on that. How did, how did that heal? How did that change? What was going on there? Um, you know, a lot of the lesions that you see in the brain are a result of healing. They just didn't heal as well at that time. So lifestyle, diet, supplements, and medication all are part of this, right? This, this is all part of this four pillar strategy. Uh, so focus a little deeper on the supplements since that's what the topic today is. So antioxidants, as I mentioned, there's vitamins, vitamin A or beta carotene, which can kind of be transformed into vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, of supplementing vitamin E. For some reason, I just, uh, in my experience, I've never really seen it uh, be all that helpful. Uh, it's not like you can necessarily measure that. Um, and there's studies looking at using vitamin E in conjunction with other, you know, treatments, you know, various things like, you know, people with, with history of lung cancer or prostate cancer. And vitamin E doesn't seem to be that protective all by itself. Um, and, and my sense from that is that, that vitamin E is a unique molecule. It is, it's something called amphoteric. So it's, it's water soluble and fat soluble and it kind of sits in the middle. And so it can pass things through itself, you know, take something that was in fat, like the brain, uh, you know, an, an oxidizing agent that's in the brain, that's all fatty, grab that electron and move it into water where vitamin C can take it. So it's a little bit of a middleman. And it could be, you know, this is my own theory. I have nothing to base this off of from my own thinking, but it could be that having all that vitamin E as you supplement might create too many middlemen. Maybe it's passing too many uh, oxidants back and forth and you never really are able to kind of catch them. And so it creates more damage. Oxidation in fat tissue is certainly more complicated. It can bounce through all those carbon chains a little more aggressively. Um, so it could be that vitamin E is not something that you need to have a ton of. But if you don't have any, you can't pass those things through. Um, so for that reason, E doesn't really fall very high on my list of things that people need to worry about. Um, selenium is a really interesting, you know, micro mineral that you don't need very much of. But if you don't have any, you can't make glutathione. And glutathione is important, uh, as I mentioned here, this GSH. So NAC, N-acetylcysteine, the, the amino acid above there and selenium, that metal, get together with a couple other amino acids and they make glutathione. So selenium and NAC, those two that you see above, form the, the kind of rate limiting important steps of glutathione. So having enough of this, uh, Brazil nuts are a great source. Um, and maybe even supplementing something like NAC, which is something that can help with liver function, help with lung function. You know, certainly been on some of my COVID protocols when people are getting mad, I make sure that NAC is something that they're taking so it can help their lungs. That, that these two coming together can make more glutathione, which is your major antioxidant. Uh, from a dietary standpoint, the brassica family, uh, which is your broccoli, cauliflower, kale, uh, Brussels sprouts, um, cabbage, they have uh, chemical constituents in them that actually have antioxidant activity themselves, or they stimulate the body to make more antioxidants like glutathione. An example of that is something called sulforaphane, which is found in broccoli. 
So one could take sulforaphane, which is a, a compound that has been taken away from you know, broccoli, it's been, it's been isolated. And then in the body, it stimulates the response of making more antioxidants inside. So it kind of has this amplification effect. Or you can just eat a lot of broccoli, right? Um, you know, looking at, I'll talk about this in a bit, but looking at some of the diets around MS, something like the wall protocol, the Brassica family is its own unique part of that dietary protocol. Not only are you supposed to be eating leafy greens and brightly colored vegetables, but very specifically this family of, of Brassica. And so that's part of that is that antioxidant quality there. Alpha lipoic acid, you guys might be hearing more about this because they're doing more and more studies. A Swedish uh, hospital here in, in Seattle is doing a study on alpha lipoic acid for you know, the effect on progressive MS. Um, I've seen a couple uh, patients that I have down in California who've been sending their notes up from some of the, the doctors down in California, some of the neurologists down there. I'm seeing alpha lipoic acid show up on more treatment plans. Now, this is something I've used for years um, because it's an antioxidant that's specific to the nervous system. Um, you know, it, it's actually part of a, a electron chain issue in, in the mitochondria as well as a form of something called coenzyme A. But alpha lipoic acid is, is one of these really special, I think, antioxidants for someone with a neurological condition. Um, What's unique here and what's important to know as a consumer is that if alpha lipoic acid is made in a lab, if it's made synthetically, that anytime you make something synthetically, it's not made in nature, it's made you know, by a chemical reaction, by putting two you know, chemicals together and washing them you know, form in a, in a bucket. It does something called a racemic mix where it's 50% one shape, which is usually called left-handed, and then 50% another shape, right-handed, right? And so there's these different forms, these, these, these uh, iso isoforms. In the case of lipoic acid, you only want the R form, the right-handed form. You don't want the S form, the sinister, as a left-handed person, I've always felt a little, you know, being called sinister. But that S form um, is, is considered to be not as effective if effective at all. Um, so when purchasing something like lipoic acid, you want to see, you know, is this, is this compound R and S in which case 50% of what I'm buying is not useful and maybe not good for me, or is it only R in which case it's what you want, right? So these are these little tricky things that, that no one tells you, which again is, you know, why I have on the, what you need to know. So lipoic acid is an important antioxidant, uh, I, I feel. Moving into the anti-inflammatory, um, you know, the, the one that gets a lot of attention and I think it's deserved is turmeric. Uh, it has these curcuminoids, the, the, so the herb turmeric has a compound in it called curcuminoids. And these are thought to be the, the most active compounds within there. And so often you'll see on a label, you know, some turmeric blend or something. And then you look on the back and it's like standardized to 95% of curcuminoids. And you're like, okay, then. But that's actually telling you something really important. That's saying we took the turmeric, we extracted the most, you know, important compound from that. And that's what you're taking, which is a little bit different than taking just the herb. You can take just the herb. It's a food. It's very safe. And it's important to know with turmeric, we're so inclined to believe that one capsule, one tablet of something is what you take, right? That, that you know, you would take a you know, 200 milligram of ibuprofen and that's what it comes in is a 200 milligram capsule. And so you take one. And so when it comes to turmeric, a lot of people have that same idea, like, well, it's 500 milligrams in a capsule. And so I would take one. But the reality is turmeric is much you know, it's not absorbed very well and its activity is not incredibly strong. And so I'll always say turmeric is not mobic. You know, mobic, mobic is a very powerful antioxidant. You don't need very much of it. Where with turmeric, you need quite a bit, 
So 500 milligram capsule, you might need to take three before that actually does something that you're looking for. You know, in the case of turmeric, the herb, you know, 500 milligrams of the herb is essentially a tenth of a teaspoon. And so that's not going to do very much. You probably need a teaspoon, which is five grams. And so if you're, if you're putting that into say a smoothie, making something called golden milk, where you put some turmeric and maybe some coconut milk and maybe a little bit of honey, um, that, that needs to have you know, uh, two tablespoons, you know, maybe even three tablespoons of turmeric before it's gonna have a good anti-inflammatory effect. Um, so it's important to think about strength of what you're taking as well. If something is standardized, these curcuminoids, it is going to be a bit stronger. Um, omega-3, so flax, fish, algae, these are all sources of omega-3. That's important because of the way omega-3s impact the way the body deals with, with damage. That when a cell breaks, when there's some kind of cell damage, there's a cascade of events that occur after that. And so if your body has more omega-3s, then that inflammatory response may not be as aggressive as it would be otherwise. Um, and so, you know, there's other ways to get around this too, you know, eating fish, uh, definitely cold water fish. Um, the reason omega-3s are in fish, certainly the cold water ones, is that if they have these uh, unsaturated fats in their body, they can go deeper into the ocean, they can go to colder places and not freeze up, right? If a fish was filled with coconut oil, which I'm not sure if you've seen much coconut oil in your house, but it gets hard when it gets cold, um, you know, these fish would freeze up in the ocean and drop to the bottom and die, right? So you, you have to have something that can handle these changes in temperature. And so you find that in these cold water fish. I like sardines as a choice for omega-3s versus the larger fish. Um, but even grass-fed, you know, animals, things that, that maybe are more wild um, will have more omega-3s than something that's been raised uh, with grain or, or maybe corn or something that's more omega-6. Yeah. Um, Boswellia, that's also an herb that has some antioxidant or sorry, anti-inflammatory qualities to it. Um, often I see that used for pain, um, headaches, uh, joint pains. It, it affects a different enzyme um, than say the, the uh, Advil or aspirin or something. Um, but it's, it's also anti-inflammatory. And so that's something that, that I've seen people use. And there's even theories about digestive enzymes, that if you take digestive enzymes, you break down your food a bit more, but also helps to maybe break down some of the proteins that would cause inflammation. Um, and so I've had some patients with, you know, lifelong autoimmune conditions that they're managing with digestive enzymes and other things. Immunomodulation. So again, this is important. Uh, part of uh, the kind of autoimmune story, how to treat that. It was a realization to me that the immune system lives in your gut. I mean, I think for the longest time, I'd always think about drawing blood from someone and think, well, I'm gonna check their cells. But what I was really doing is really just counting cars on the freeway, you know, I'm watching them go by, you know, here we got, we got a red one, a white one, we got a semi, you know, uh, where they're going, where they're, where they're leaving to and going to work and where they're coming home to matters. And so most of the, most of the immune system lives in the gut. It lives in these places called the galt, or the malt. And so it makes sense, right? If you, if you put something into your body, if you swallow it, you know, that's kind of the dirtiest place you're going to expose, right? If there was something on the floor, I could pick it up and eat it, hopefully, you know, wouldn't do it on camera. But if I put that same thing in my veins, I would die, right? So there's a difference between putting something in your body versus directly in. And so the, the immune system sits right at that dirtiest place of your body to watch things come in and, and gets ready. And so if it's being told that a lot of dirty stuff is coming down the track, it's going to be really focused on the outside world. It's a dirty world out there. Um, if there isn't that much dirt to deal with, it might turn itself inward and start to look for stuff to fight on the inside. 
And so there's some interesting, you know, longitudinal studies looking at children from other countries who've been exposed to tropical diseases or parasites or other things that don't develop autoimmune diseases at the same rate as, you know, some of our cleaner societies. And so is that, you know, is, is that just a coincidence? Or is there something about the way the immune system is triggered by this kind of dirty world that we're putting in our mouths? And if we're not doing that, then the immune system is not triggered as much to look out and it looks more in. And so that's why I think something like probiotics are really important because that's putting safe dirt. You know, probiotics are essentially friendly dirt, but you're friendly bacteria that you're putting in, your immune system has no idea they're friendly. It didn't ask. It just knows, you know, five, 10 billion things just showed up today and we need to be ready to deal with it. Those organisms are not harmful. You know, in some cases, they're very beneficial. They might make vitamins or other things for us, break down foods. But the immune system is triggered by those presence of cell walls and kind of creates a barrier there and, and sets a presence looking on the outside. And so if it's being, you know, regularly triggered to look out, it's going to be ready when things show up. Um, and there are things that people eat that might trigger the immune system further. There may be a particular, you know, intolerance or a particular allergy, you know, maybe something like celiac, where there's actually changes in the gut lining that make the immune system even more upset in the sense that everything's kind of sliding right through. Um, so, you know, in some cases with my patients, I may do a set of, you know, allergy tests and say, you know, is there some particular food that we need to cut out? Because while it didn't cause your MS, it might trigger your immune system to be upset and then start to turn itself inward to look for more of these things and maybe in the process create some inflammatory response that can then cascade. We know for sure with with you know ms that a urinary tract infection an upper respiratory infection you know these kind of things can can kind of be the precursor to a relapse and so if we can shift the immune system to be a little bit more aware and protected and and less you know upset not being poked all the time then over time there may be less relapses and therefore you know less progression of condition and then looking at, you know, as I mentioned, the diets, the diets are often focused around all these things, these immunomodulation, the anti-inflammatory, the antioxidant, so a wall protocol, the swank diet, McDougal, even the DASH diet, I've seen some research on that, just cutting out some, you know, sodium and processed foods, there's some concern that maybe sodium uh, too much sodium in the body might actually trigger some of the, the firing in the nervous system. Um, maybe lead it to kind of short out a little too soon. Um, so even just too much salt might be a problem. From a supplement standpoint, the two that make the most, you know, importance in my mind is vitamin D, which I'm sure all of you are aware of. Vitamin D is interesting because vitamin D is not a vitamin as much as it's a hormone. It's, it's something that, that influences the way cells develop. I like to think of it as graduate school for cells. It helps to teach them, you know, to become the best they can be, right? So in the presence of a lot of vitamin D, cells differentiate very well. And in the case of T cells, these T helper cells and, and other parts of the immune system, it can actually shift the balance of what kind of cells they become and therefore what kind of teachers they become to other cells. And so vitamin D can influence the immune system over long periods of time because it has an impact on the cells that then influence other cells. Um, you know, your immune system, there are parts of your immune system that are considered to be immortal, but often those cells live about six months. They're kind of around, they do their thing, they look for what they look for. And then as they start to divide and, and make, you know, daughters essentially, they pass on this information and say, you know, uh, this is what I used to fight. There's this thing called myelin. I don't really like it. You shouldn't like it either, right? And so if that cell grows up in the presence of more vitamin D, maybe it doesn't fight myelin as hard. And then when it 
gives birth to its daughters. It's like, well, you know, Mylan, it's there, but we don't need to hate it as much as my mom did, you know? And so there's this idea of kind of changing the immune system over time. Um, so when it comes to, to vitamin D dosing, every, everyone's kind of different, right? I mean, I, I have neurologists that I work with that are like 800 I use is plenty. You needn't take any more. Um, and there's this Coinbird protocol. I have a doctor in Brazil who's like, yeah, 20, 200,000 I use for a little bit is probably okay. Right. And that to me is beyond what I'm willing to do. Um, so I kind of range, I'm in the, I'm in the Northwest. So suggesting vitamin D is pretty easy because, you know, I can kind of assume that most people aren't getting it all year. Um, and so I'll range, you know, 2000 to 6,000, your body can absorb up to 10. So 10,000 I use for a period of time is not a concern. It would be smart to get a blood value and see what that, you know, three, five, six months of 10,000 is doing because there is a point where calcium can raise and that can cause, especially for someone who has already spasticity, if your calcium gets too high, that makes muscles contract. And so you don't really wanna make a spasticity worse because your calcium is too high from the vitamin D that you're taking to try to help your immune system. Um, but you know, there's theories around uh, vitamin D receptors and how that influences you know, uh, the immune system over time. And, you know, we just have to wait and see how, how effective those kinds of protocols are. Probiotics, also very important. Um, is colony forming units uh, is what you're looking for on a label. So if you see a probiotic that's designated in milligrams, you know, there's 200 milligrams of, of probiotic in there, that's a confusing designation you don't really i don't really know what to do with that that just means how much it weighed it doesn't really tell me what the bacteria is going to do once it gets into your body is it something that's going to form a certain number of colonies is it going to last so you're always looking for colony forming units and generally you're looking for billions you know 5 billion 10 billion 50 billion 100 billion the research looking at, you know, certainly animal models and kind of extrapolating that into human would suggest that 10 billion CFUs of three or more types of, you know, bacteria, in which case I just tell patients, if you see three Latin names or more kind of in cursive there, and it says 10 billion, then you're, you're in the right ballpark, that this is something that is, is in the right world. There are very particular uh, strains that have been studied in the animal forms of MS, something called EAE. So there's a lactobacillus rhamnosus, lactobacillus plantarum. These things have been, been studied and been shown to reduce the amount of lesions and the amount of activity that happens uh, in these animals. Some of the first probiotic studies, the, the theory was that the probiotics would be immunostimulatory and therefore damaging to the animal. And so that by giving a probiotic to a, a rat, you're basically going to see that disease progress. And what they saw instead was that these rats were doing better. And so then they had to figure out, well, like what, what happened there? You know? And there's even you know, some, some animals here in Seattle that are the Benaroya Research Institute that have a TH17 gene knockout that makes it so that they will guarantee develop the condition if you just let them be. If, if, you, if you just let them grow up, they will develop the, the you know, uh, animal version of MS. But if you expose them to probiotics when they're first you know, born, kind of like the idea of people with tropical diseases, they don't develop the disease at all. And so to me, that's fascinating. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's research to me that's worth really leaning into. But when I've talked to the researchers about it, they're like, yeah, it's kind of what we expected. But I don't, I don't know why, why that's not you know, moved into some other avenue somehow. Um, I'm seeing hands and questions. I, I think I'm, I'm gonna try to get through this and then I, I promise to answer questions uh, at the end. Um, and then the last pillar here is this repair, remyelination, regeneration. Um, so uh, it's, 
that's a primary thing in my mind because so often my patients are concerned with progression, but they're often concerned with, well, how do I make what I have going on better? How can I improve how I feel? How, how can I not have this neuropathy anymore or, or you know, improve my balance or whatever it might be? And the brain is an amazing thing. The, the brain, the plasticity of the brain is amazing. And, and again, these things are, are you know, reforming all the time. New connections and new neurons, they exist. And so sleep is one of those places that really needs to be focused on. And so when it comes to repair, sleep is the thing I think of. And, and so supplements may or may not be the strategy for that. Right. It might be helpful. Um, sleep hygiene is an important thing. Learning, learning about how you best sleep, where you best sleep, what your sleep structure is, you know, how you can be the most comfortable. You know, sleep's an interesting thing. It is, it is the kind of most vulnerable one could be, right? You, you, are, you are putting yourself in a place where you are, are you know, removing yourself from consciousness. And so if there's a history of trauma, if there's a history of anxiety, if there's a history of fear, that's not, you know, something that just necessarily goes away. And so sleep might be the place where that crops up, right? Is this a safe time for me to be unconscious? And just as, you know, if you were running from a lion or something and you ran until you were so exhausted, you had to sleep, you would sleep, but you would probably wake up as soon as you were rested enough to keep running, right? So chances are that, you know, you would be running through the jungle and take a, you know, 10 hour nap somewhere <laughs> pretty low, right? It's going to be a short burst of sleep and then you're up and ready to go. And a lot of people live their whole lives this way. They, they are waiting for this uh, kind of just enough recovery to keep running. And so if that's part of a history for you, if that's, if that's something that, that is true for you, then figuring out what the basis of that fear, that trauma, that anxiety is, is going to help your sleep. In some cases, it's just the condition itself, right? The, the, there's difficulty with movement. There's, there's all the anxiety and fear of having the condition. There's pain. Um, you may not get the activity that you need in the day. And so then you're restless through the night. And so that, that can be a very difficult thing to manage in a condition that has such a broad impact, right? MS can do just about anything. And, and so it's, it's hard to make a general statement about how best to help someone with sleep that might be having their sleep impacted because of the condition itself. Um, but melatonin is something that I think is, is really useful. And, and I can actually see this little, uh, question that just popped up. So one of the things that they say with melatonin, and it's been said for years, is that melatonin is immunostimulatory and so may not be good in autoimmune diseases. You know, I, I, I came into medicine with that statement, but I've seen, I've, I've been to various CMSC and other things where they've talked about melatonin for sleep Exercise is immunostimulatory. There's no doctor that would tell you not to exercise because it stimulates your immune system. Sleep is immunostimulatory. You know, so there, melatonin is something that everybody makes. So you know, it, it could have an impact on the immune system, but I don't know how we would ever really know that. Um, and I think the benefits of melatonin, in my opinion, outweigh that. Melatonin is an antioxidant by itself. So just its chemical structure is going to scavenge antioxidants and the brain will pull it up. If it sees it in the blood, it'll grab it and put it right in the brain. <coughs> Excuse me. It stimulates um, glutathione production in the brain. So melatonin will stimulate glutathione, which again is an antioxidant. And melatonin enhances slow wave sleep, which is one of the points at which you heal. So there's this trifecta of melatonin that has, you know, a dramatic impact on the brain. Now I have patients who don't tolerate it. Um, and so what I tell those patients are, you know, start low, you know, sometimes the melatonin less is more. So a half a milligram, a milligram, you know, you start 
a few minutes before you would normally want to go to bed. So 20, 30 minutes before your, your, your optimal bedtime, turn off all the lights, you know, don't stimulate yourself, just kind of get down into a dark place. Um, and then what it should do is enhance sleep onset. For some people, the dreams are too much. They don't like the dreams they have on melatonin. Uh, some people wake up in the middle of the night, they feel groggy. So if melatonin is something that you can't supplement, fine. You still need to enhance its production naturally in your body. And so that's done through, you know, avoiding a lot of lights and, and other things. So uh, melatonin is super important. Uh, magnesium, also helpful, can, can reduce some of the, the tension in the body. Magnesium is something that relaxes muscles. To contract a muscle, you have to use calcium. That's what binds those things together. Magnesium is what unhooks that contraction. So magnesium allows for relaxation. Um, L-theanine, a very safe amino acid that, that helps with slow wave sleep. <clears throat> the same thing with L-glycine. And then more recently, you know, CBD, THC, CBG, some of these, uh, you know, cannabinoids and, and their impact on, on the nervous system. And so, you know, the issue there is, you know, in a state like Washington, it's not a big deal. I have patients who come in all the time and say, you know, I'm using these gummies for sleep um, or I have this tincture or, you know, whatever it might be. I generally do not... Uh, support isn't the right word. Um, if I have a patient who is inhaling uh, marijuana, either through, you know, combusting it or vaping it, I'm generally trying to get them to use a different route. Um, you know, the, the smoking is not great for the lungs and vaping, we, we don't know really what some of these oils and other things that are in there, some of the carriers, and, you know, it's very rare, but there are cases where the lithium battery has exploded and blown people's jaws off. So, um, you know, or they blow up in a car because they get hot or something. So these little pens, you know, they look fine, but the, there could be danger in that stick. Um, versus marijuana by mouth, I mean, it is so safe, right? There's a question about allergy, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, it... it the likelihood that it's going to create some kind of overdose or some kind of problem, um, extremely low. Now, consuming too much for your system and having a really rough, you know, six hours of, you know, hiding in the closet could happen, right? And so that's something that you need to be mindful of uh, for, for consuming that. But, you know, there's, there's the LD50, which is what's used to assess whether or not something is dangerous. You know, like the LD50 of, of Tylenol is quite, quite low. You, you can't take very much of it. Um, the LD50 of, of, you know, THC and, and marijuana is quite high. Uh, it's, it's not something that's easy to, to get sick. You know, you can feel sick, but diff different thing. Um, Another important or important parts of nerve repair, methylation. Um, methylation is, is a hugely important chemical reaction in the body. It's used in the liver, it's used in the brain. And so to get methylation, you have to bring methyl donors. You need, you need methyl donors to bring methyl groups. And so B12, B6, folate, SAMe, those are your general methyl donors. And so I like methylated forms of these vitamins. You know, I mentioned Deplin which is a methylated form of folate. It's a methyl folate. Um, methyl B12 or something called P5P, which is a methylated uh, B6. Um, you know, you can get these vitamins as, as non-methylated and your body has to add a methyl group to it, right? So if you bring it in methylated already, you kind of bring, you bring a methyl group to the party already. Um, and then looking at things like, you know, neurogenesis, you know, this stimulating what is already occurring in the brain to some extent, these new neurons coming on, um, you know, some of the research there. And so, you have, you know, lion's mane, this is, this is something that is getting a lot of tension um, that, that, you know, may support remyelination. So that's, that's something that is, is important. 
Um, Skullcap, which is an herb, there's a compound called Bicolin, and so they're doing some research uh, with uh, spinal cord injuries in rats and seeing whether or not the application of this compound actually improves the way those nerves repair. Um, lithium orotate. Now, lithium, when you say lithium to a provider or kind of the general public, the first thing they think of is lithium carbonate, kind of a one flew over the cuckoo's nest, uh, you know, this, this thing for bipolar or mania. Lithium can be used in very small amounts where it's more of like a, a vitamin or it helps neurotransmission. So what they have done is looked at people who were on lithium carbonate for, for medical treatment, you know, grams of lithium uh, to control, you know, mood disorders, whatever it might be. And they actually see that some of that, uh, those individuals don't have as much atrophy in their brain. And so the idea is that lithium might improve that. And so then there's studies looking at low doses of lithium you know, milligrams versus grams. So five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20. Um, and that lithium enhances not only some of the firing in the brain, um, but also can support some neurogenesis. And then, you know, one of my personal favorites, the CDP choline or citicoline. This is a precursor to uh, acetylcholine, which is what the brain uses for processing speed. It's kind of what fires all these signals around. Um, and some studies, you know, in Europe, mostly looking at this for mild cognitive impairment or MCI, some studies in this country, traumatic brain injury. This is a product I use quite frequently with patients, uh, certainly those that have had a recent, you know, concussion, maybe someone who has a recent stroke, um, someone who's had a recent relapse. And so there's some damage that we're concerned about, you know, that showed up on the MRI. You know, if I have a patient who has an active lesion, I'm often recommending some alpha lipoic acid, some you know, CDP choline. I wanna to try to make sure that whatever is some magnesium, whatever can get in there and really help that tissue to heal as best as possible. Cause you kind of get that one shot in the beginning. And if that tissue can get laid down really well in the beginning, you might get better function versus trying you know, after the fact to try to get some other part of the brain to make up for whatever uh, damage was there. Oh uh, yeah, FXN does stand for function. So in summary, uh, supplements, you know, there's thousands of them. And for the most part, they're pretty loosely regulated. You know, you, you, you are in the wild west in some ways as a consumer without much, you know, knowledge, what to buy, like how, how do you know? Um, so for me, uh, you know, the way I try and, and function, I've never felt good, you know, running a business and saying like, you need to buy these. These are my supplements that you need to buy. This is some kind of salesy thing about that that I've never really liked. But I do like the idea that everything that I do carry and everything I do recommend has been tested by some third party. You know, I have a, a sheet of paper that can say, this is exactly what's in this label. It is the R form of alpha lipoic acid. It is the UBQH form of CoQ10, you know, whatever it might be. This is, this is the lion's mane that comes from the guy who, you know, is a, a mushroom uh, pro and he would never choose anything that wasn't, you know, the best product. Um, and so that's, that's something that uh, I, I try to stick to. Patients will bring things in and I try to look at the label and say, oh, well, it's got, you know, here's got a little NSF thing. Here's the GMP thing. Oh, look, it, it says, you know, methylfolate, anyone who's going to, you know, any company that's going to go through the trouble of, of paying for the patent for the methylfolate to put in their product is probably doing the same thing with other products. So that's probably a good sign. Um, but it's difficult. It's hard for me to say that there's a particular brand that's good. But in general, supplements are going to have a support function. They're going to be an, an also and, you know, in, rather than an instead. Um, you should be consulting with somebody, you know, someone who has some expertise, or if you want to, you know, spend the hours, you know, in the rabbit hole of the internet trying to develop your own expertise, you can do that. I mean, you can go to a company go to their website, see if you can download the PDF of their product to see if it's been tested. You know, you can call them, you know, you could, you could do the legwork and try to figure out if they've got all the, all the, you know, 
T's crossed and I's dotted and all that. Um, and so I think the main thing to take away, certainly in something like MS, if it sounds too good to be true, you know, if someone's like this product, I took it for a month and my MS went away, you know, that's not really how things go. I mean, it could be, it hasn't in my experience. Now I've given someone a B12 shot and had them feel amazing, right? Uh, enhanced their, you know, nerve function and maybe they needed it. And, and so that B12, you know, may have had the effect of reversing a relapse to some extent, um, but it didn't cure their MS, right? So it's just important to know kind of what the purpose of what you're doing each thing for and to just not overdo it and, and really focus on that it's lifestyle, it's sleep, it's diet, it's stress management. It's all those things that, you know, I always tell patients, we don't know necessarily what would make you better, but I know how to make you worse. Like if I wanted to make your MS worse, I got, I got a really good protocol for it. You start smoking, you gain as much weight as you can. You live a super stressful life where you don't get enough sleep and you feel like you're constantly under the gun and, and nothing really goes your way. Um, and you get sick as much as you can. And you get some UTIs, some urinary tract infections. If you can get sick three, four, five times a year, you're pretty much set to have your MS progress really well, right? So you have to think about the inverse of that. Well, how do I make sure I'm not smoking anything? Make sure my diet is really focused on, you know, whole foods that are lots of colors and, and have lots of antioxidants and, and aren't aggravating my immune system in my gut. Um, how can I sleep? How can I move? What can I do these things that kind of improve my overall well-being? Um, so that's just more of this, right? These antioxidants, diet supplements, immunomodulation, um, you know, repair, and, and all those things there. Um, some more resources for you. So this is just kind of the FDA's, you know, cut, cut and paste there of, of uh, supplements, kind of how they view them. This again, kind of legally stuff. This is this uh, textbook that was referenced where I wrote chapter nine, which is the uh, multiple sclerosis. So what I call that? Um, I should know this, right? Integrative Approaches to Multiple Sclerosis, that's chapter nine um, of this book here, Integrative Neurology. I don't get any money for it. This, this was my payment right here, was this one copy. Um, but, you know, some street cred. Uh, and then Dr. Alan Bowling, who you guys may recognize that name. He's a Colorado neurologist. Uh, he ran the Rocky Mountain MS Center for a bit. He's kind of thought to be the expert neurologist on anything alternative supplement wise I know him we've talked many times we have different views on things um you know he he's written a whole lot on cannabis he's he's done a, an incredible amount of research on that because Colorado is one of the first states to to move forward with that so he's he's a great resource for that um so I'm going to start to kind of tear through this uh list of questions. Deborah, is there anything that you want to say before I? Number one, that was amazing information. <laughs> so okay. Great, um, great, great information. Do you, um, I don't know if you have access to everything. Can we at least start with the initial question that came in about a list yeah, of says? For sure. There's quite a few on the chat too. Um, yep. I think I've got 12 or 13 questions on that. Right. We have Q&A. So if we yeah. do the ones that came in initially. Sure, yeah, I'm open. Elizabeth, who says she's, she said, if you're allergic to MMJ, cannabis, hemp, is there anything equivalent, natural like cannabis, not medicinal, that can help spasticity and neurologic pain? Yeah, I mean, to, to be completely honest, there isn't anything quite like cannabis. It is a very unique plant. It, it's very rare to have something that has so much impact on the human physiology and so little risk. Um, you know, most things that can affect the brain and the body in that way would have some kind of, you know, you're going to die if you get too much of this or, you know, something. Not to say it's without risk and not to say that people haven't been harmed from it, but, you know, comparing it to say alcohol or opioids or or benzodiazepines or really anything else the 
from from the effect it has on the on the human body it's it's pretty incredible that it's as safe as it is um so the allergy i think i would have a few more questions as to what specifically that is is it an allergy to the plant in which case maybe the oils the extracts or something may not have the same effect because allergies are generally to proteins so if there were a way to get an extract that maybe wasn't from the plant you know didn't have as much plant material in it um you know maybe topical versus inhaled like I, I don't know an allergy is an allergy and so if you got an allergy there isn't really a way around it and i don't think that there's really much that has quite the same impact as a singular thing now something like kava which is a root i've had some you know good benefit for that reducing spasticity for helping with sleep um, there's some great teas. Yogi makes a tea called Kava Stress Relief that's got some lavender and some kava in it. Um, and so that that has an impact. Um, but I I don't, I kind of think of, of cannabis as its own animal in that way. Um, and so you would be trying to kind of cut and paste some other things that had individual function to try to combine that that singular thing. Um, passion flower, I've heard, you know, extracts of that might be helpful for spasticity. Um, so I think my my first my first question would be, what kind of allergy? And my my second point would be, there isn't really much like it. If if it if you can't take it there probably isn't one thing that that replaces it. Thank you. Um, we did have a couple questions and I know you mentioned it um, a little earlier in your slide about the um, the lion's mane. Yeah. Um, and they, it, somebody wanted to know, is the pill form better than the actual plant? Um, so my concern with the actual plant is just the uh, identification of it. You know, mushroom identification is a very difficult thing. I took, you know, a, a 400 level class in college to learn to identify, you know, fungus. I took an additional class when I was in med school. I've done spore prints. You know, I've, I've looked at all the drawings. I've looked at fruiting bodies. Like I'm interested in, in mushrooms and, and fungus. I think they're fascinating. One of the most amazing kind of uh, organisms that we have um and i don't feel confident identifying them in nature so you know it, if you knew for sure that's what it was but i i kind of feel like i'd rather have a label a company that is like yeah we we made sure this wasn't toxic and and we're going to put it out there so there's a company called fungi perfecti a gentleman named paul statements he's in my opinion he's like the mycology guy and so any product put out by them, I trust, because I know that he has done the work. And so we carry that lion's mane in our, in our facility. I believe one capsule has 550, 500 milligrams, something like that. Um, and usually it's recommended to take a gram a day, at least, you know, if not twice a day. So it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, but it doesn't matter what, because that was part of the question. It doesn't matter how much the person weighs they would take the same amount of grams? Yeah, I mean, it, it must matter on some level, but I don't think we really know enough about the constituents to say at what point it becomes therapeutic. And again, I think we're, we're stuck on that mindset of like a capsule, right? And capsules are just that size. That's what you can swallow. So the idea that one capsule is enough is is not necessarily the way things kind of play out. So, you know, two, two is a gram. And that to me, you know, certainly from a from an ability to take it and an ability to afford it, you know, it's going to do what it's going to do. I, I don't really know whether three grams is what you need to get remyelination or not. Um, I'd love to have that information, but it's just not something that I have access to. Thank you. Um, Joanne asked, what are your thoughts on alpha lipoic acid for neuropathy and what dose would she take if there is such a? Yeah, so I, 
I love ALA. I think it's one of the things that I'm, I'm constantly recommending for my patients with neurological issues. Um, the, the dosages that were, were pushed out for the study was 600 milligrams twice a day. This was the MS study. So 1200 milligrams or yeah, 1200 total. Um, I've had some people, you know, one that can be cost prohibitive for some, you know, it's not, it's not the most inexpensive supplement. Um, so I kind of feel like any is something. So if hundred milligrams in there, then hundred milligrams is what you're doing. And that's more than you're doing yesterday. Right. 1200 is what's been done in research. And so we'll come to find out if that had a, a measurable difference, whether there was a different study group or not, you know, looking at those. Um, so 600 is kind of a meet the middle for me. It's, I know that most people can, you know, take that and tolerate that and it's doing something. So when it comes to ALA, I'd say any is something, um, 600 is, is, you know, threading the needle and 1200 is on the high end there. Um, and yeah, it's used for diabetic neuropathy. It's used for idiopathic neuropathy. It's used, um, I'm trying to think of couple other conditions but it's 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 typically something that helps with the protection of nerves thank you um i think you mentioned this also but jason asked what do you think about using fermented foods in order to promote probiotics in the gut yeah so it's a great uh natural source in general that's going to be one type of organism so it's, it's usually a, a single strain of something. Um, and so there's, there's benefit there that you're bringing in these prebiotics, the stuff that the bug likes to eat. And then it has the bug itself on there. So it's those probiotics there. Um, I would never discourage someone from, from eating fermented foods and, and getting it in that way. It is a single strain, and I guess is, my guess would be it's a lower content than what you can get packed in a in a supplement that has all these colony forming units. Um, but I've never done like a head to head, you know, analysis. You know, I guess we could we could do some microbiology tests and do a swab and see you know how many colonies would form. Um, but typically, you know something like a kimchi or something is going to be one one type of, of organism when it comes to kombucha which which is a yeast often that organism can't survive in the gut so you're you're introducing it in but it has trouble kind of setting up colonies and continuing so it's a great probiotic in the sense that it's it's going in there you know it's having some impact on the on the microbiome there is a response from the immune system and, and kind of all those things, but it isn't necessarily sustained in the way that like a lactobacillus that's going to set up a colony and stay there. Um, the bugs in the gut, you can kind of think of them like almost like living on these icebergs that are constantly shifting and melting. And so the inside of the gut is always pushing to the middle. It's kind of, it's just like our skin in a way, it's always sloughing. And it's always going to the center of that tube and then going out. And so 25% of stool is just these cells that are kind of sloughing and going in. And so those bacteria are getting, you know, pushed and then they're trying to find another, you know, and they're getting pushed and try to get back in there and push. And then if you dump some antibiotics in there, they die, right? And they all just slough off. And it's only the ones that were able to survive and kind of hold on. And sometimes those are not the ones you want. You know, anyone who's had C. difficile, Clostridium difficile from antibiotics can tell you, you know, when you get too many antibiotics and you're left with the bad ones, it's bad news. So you're constantly needing to repopulate them, I guess is my point. So long story short, you want to eat fermented foods, more power to you. Um, that may or may not, I can't really say for certain whether that's the equivalent to taking a 10 billion colony forming unit bacteria. Um, Esther asked where, can you mention some reputable sellers of supplements? Yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's different, so nature's way, which is a very common, you'll find it in, in lots and lots of stores, you know, they're, they're in Rite Aid and other places. 
Nature's Way was purchased by a German company called Schwabe. This was about 15 years ago. Schwabe also owns Integrative Therapeutics and Enzymatic Therapy, which are, are two companies that go direct to consumer or in my case with ITI, you know, they're a professional brand. But all three of those products are made out of the same facility. So Nature's Way, Enzymatic Therapy, and ITI are all different price points. And there's different kind of combinations of products that are in there. But in general, because of their you know, master company, everything is done on the same on the level, right? Um, a company like uh, Thorne, which is again, a direct to, to doctor company, uh, is very, they're very focused on hypoallergenic, you know, there's, they, they reduce the kind of additives that are in there. Um, and, and they're very specific with the kind of, of uh, starting, you know, these substrates, the, the raw material. And so that's a good company. Um, vital or pure encapsulations, um, Zymogen. These are the kind of companies that, that, that we use it's a little bit harder when you're just standing at the health food store and you got 15 different ones and you don't know, right? Um, now is, is a company that is, is pretty easy to, to find and has some fairly good products. So, you know, it, it kind of depends on what you're looking for. And then it still matters when you look at the label, you know, in the case of like alpha lipoic acid, is there an R and an S there? In which case, don't buy that. That's that's not something you want. If you look at the, you know, vitamin E, like I mentioned, if it says D and L on there, well, now you're seeing like, oh, that's those are two letters. I think I remember Dr. Marco saying this one thing about two letters means it was synthetic, and you only want one form, not the other. You know. Okay. So um, I don't know if I answered that or managed to talk around it. <laughs> You've, you've talked so much that if I, if I ask a question that you've already talked about, just tell me that because I'm trying to remember everything you've discussed. Somebody did, Thomas asked about broccoli sprouts. Are they as effective as broccoli? Uh, so the question is, are broccoli sprouts are effective as broccoli? Yeah. Is there a difference? You know, I, I don't know. Um, That's a good answer. What would I think of that? Uh, I would think that adult broccoli, if that's what you would call it, <laughs> versus the sprouts, um, would have a different chemical constituency than the sprouts that might be focused more on growth versus protection. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, the, the question becomes, why do these comp why do these plants even make this stuff? You know, there's been some some pretty good research looking at wild herbs versus herbs that were grown in, you know, farms. And that the ones that have to struggle to survive, the ones that are growing on rocks with not enough water and, you know, maybe too much sun, they have so much more kind of therapeutic potential because they've made all these compounds in result of the stress of their lives versus the the plants that got everything they wanted right and so uh, it would be hard to say i don't know the difference between you know kind of when the sprout would make sulforaphane versus when something else but i would say eating either one is great okay. better um, than better than gummy bears that's I would say so. Deborah's asking if you take probiotics um, and you're taking antibiotics every day for an issue, does that kill the probiotic? It does, but you're almost better off, you know, throwing them on the grenade. You know, I'd rather I'd rather it kill some of the probiotics to protect what you have in there, or at least allow for some of them to survive that onslaught. Taking them at the same time, like having them both in your stomach at the same time is probably not that smart. But a few hours apart, 
you know, take the antibiotic and then, you know, three or four or five hours later, stomach's empty. The, the antibiotics already broken down. It's in your bloodstream. It's in the, it's in the, the bowels, then taking the probiotic. Yeah. Very likely it will kill a majority of what you've just swallowed. But if you're taking, you know, 10 billion and you lose 60%, and you still got 4 billion. That's a pretty good number. Mm -hmm. She also asked her if yogurt helps with the probiotics. Well, yogurt contains them. So yeah, but it, again, it's the same with the fermented foods. Usually it's one, one single organism. Um, so yeah, it's honestly, there's a, there's a con, there's a organism called Saccharomyces boulardia. It's actually more of a yeast than, than a bacteria. It's, it's very similar to like brewer's yeast. And that has been shown to prevent some of the antibiotic problems. So, you know, the risk of C. difficile or other things. So if, if that's a concern that a patient of mine has or has a history of that, I'm usually having them do some SAC B, which is what the cool kids call it. Um, so putting in some SAC B with with that and maybe having an additional there's there's a, a company called orthomolecular products um, and there's a product they have called orthobiotic and so that has three of the strains that were used in the ms animal studies and has saccharomyces b in it and so when i have a neurologist that i'm working with that's very like by the book and doesn't want me giving their patient anything that's abnormal then I'm usually choosing that orthobiotic probiotic because I can say, well, here's these studies that show that this strain was used in these animal studies. And here's this Saccharomyces B in the event that we need to put the patient on an antibiotic for UTI or something that will prevent this C. diff. And so I'm able to use that single product as kind of a two piece to say, hey, I'm, I'm just here to try to protect our patient, you know, um, okay. versus another product that may not have those things in there. Thank you. Yaz and Barbara asked about vitamin D. Um, one of them wants to know what level of vitamin D. The other one wants to know what type of vitamin D do you recommend, like vitamin D3? Is there any? Yeah, well, D3 is what you find uh, commercially. Um, D2 is prescription. So vitamin D2 is usually prescribed at 50,000 IUs once a week. And that's a prescription that you would get from the pharmacy again it's fda approved for vitamin d deficiency it's got a label that whole thing um d3 is a more active form it's usually used in lower doses so 2000 you know 400 800 something like that they have different chemical names uh, ergo calciferol choline calciferol um levels it kind of depends on the lab because labs have different measurements but the most standard lab in the US, I think is nanograms per deciliter, microliter, something along those lines. Um, and so 50 to 75 is the range that's thought to be optimal on this test and anything under 30 is considered deficient. Anything over 100 is considered risky. So below 30, your vitamin D deficiency, above 100, you're running the risk of hypercalcemia between 50 and 75 is kind of this perfect range for supporting all the function in the body. Um, and, you know, there's certainly other physicians that would argue all around that would say, you know, it's fine if it's lower or, you know, I've had my patient be up at 200 and nothing happened. Um, so that's 50 to 75 is what I'm shooting for on a lab. Okay. Um, somebody asked if, if the slides are going to be available, and I'll discuss that later when we leave, but they are going to be available because they're going to be on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to see them in other realms also. Um, but yeah, so they will be available. And I can't really pronounce this, and I'm embarrassed, but I somebody asked about acetyl-L-carnitine. Is it? Yeah. 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 Um, well, so as I mentioned, L-carnitine is, is a, a compound that's used in the body. It's part of something called a, a, a energy transport in the mitochondria, the carnitine shuttle. Um, so carnitine is something that can be used when you have concerns about nerve function. Um, it's also something that can help with muscle development. And I've had patients who are on dialysis 
and L-carnitine can help reduce the risk of anemia from dialysis. It can, it can slow that. Um, as I mentioned, there's some anticonvulsants. Dilantin, I think, is, is the one, um, uh, valproic acid, that uh, creates a risk of low carnitine. And so you would take it in that case. So carnitine, L-carnitine is very safe. Um, acetyl L-carnitine is just a different form of it. It has an acetyl group. It's supposed to be more absorbable in the stomach. Um, so it tends to be a little more pricey. You know, acetyl L-carnitine tends to cost a little bit more than L-carnitine. Um, so that's, it. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the, the question might be, but yes, I have had patients with, you know, MS use that for nerve support or muscle support or energy support or, you know, whatever it might be. Marco, do you, I know it's late. We went way past. Do you have a couple more minutes to do a few I do. Yeah. So Barbara's asked um, what you recommend for fatigue being the worst of her symptoms. Yeah, symptom management gets tricky. Um, you know, the fatigue, I understand the question. I think the answer is, is super complex, right? The, the first thing would be sleep. Right. That, and, and so is that, so I, I don't, I don't know how to answer that in a simple way with a simple supplement. Um, I've had patients, there's an herb called rhodiola, rose root. It's an adrenal support, um, very safe, uh, rhodiola, R H O D I O L A R H O D I O rhodiola. Um, it, it's been studied for you know altitude sickness, for performance enhancement, other things. It kind of loosely the studies are loosely support that. Um, but for my patients who would normally take like Provigil, but they don't like the way it makes them feel, I've had them take Rhodiola, and they're like, yeah, it's kind of like a weak Provigil. Like, yeah, I could I could see how that helps with focus and keeps me awake, and you know, it's it's kind of like you know in the way of having a cup of coffee to stay awake, but it doesn't have the same jittery effects. Um, does that really solve the fatigue? Not necessarily, but there's some, some symptom management there. Um, but I would say that MS fatigue is such a huge problem that I would need more, more time and, and focus to get a good answer on that. Okay. Um, Allison said currently she's taking baclofen, Marinol, CBD oil, and she has Botox injections for spasticity and spasm. It still has extensor spasticity, especially when she's still in the middle of the night. Do you have any recommend, recommended supplements to reduce that problem? Yeah, I mean, that spasticity is, is really, really difficult once it sets in. Um, magnesium is, is something that I, is super safe, right. And, and done in, in low enough doses orally won't cause diarrhea. If you take too much, you get diarrhea, but you can magnesium oil. I've had some patients where they get magnesium topical and, and put that on. Um, you know, it's often with spasticity and MS, it's difficult to kind of get in and out of like a bath. So like a, a Epsom salt bath isn't really practical. Um, but something like that, where you can get kind of magnesium on the surface to soak into the muscles can help it to relax. Um, Marinol is not really the same thing as cannabis. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a synthetic. It's used more for kind of the nausea piece. So maybe there's some benefit to something like CBD or THC or something else that that's more natural in the cannabis world versus Marinol, which is a um, derivative. Um, <clears throat> anything about propionic acid for MS? Propionic acid? Propionic, forgive me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know a ton about that. When I think of that, I think of digestion. I, I, I know that that's maybe like a, a, a breakdown product in the gut. I, I, have to, I have to be honest, I don't know a ton about that. And I could look into it, but it's not something that makes sense. Um, 
does meditation do you do you have any feelings about meditation and how it can help cell repair yeah i mean meditation is is amazing in that way right that that you're able to kind of one relax right the ability to to get the system to to relax um the idea of of putting together these visuals of like a healing light and all these things can help to to stimulate the cells to grow and and repair um i don't think there's any you know negative on meditation and so even if it's just helping with sleep it's doing something for the nervous system um let's see we have there was a recent study called n acetoglucose yeah, melatonin by triggering do you see that one mm -hmm. yeah so in how nac is called nac this one's called nag nag um so it was first used in supporting the gut because um, it helps with with repairing the gut lining. So you see a lot of that with leaky gut and other things. So yeah, I have seen this and, and I have seen it used in some products. Um, I haven't used this exclusively. Um, so I, I, I can't speak to it uh, from a therapeutic standpoint to say, yeah, I, I've had patients who have taken this and have seen improvement. It makes sense. Um, it's it's part of a repair, repair process. Um, nag was first used as i'm aware as more of the gut healing world and maybe as part of that kind of got picked up as as part of helping to, to heal the nervous system as well um so uh i think my my only concerns with it would be that it's one of these you know sulfur containing compounds just like nac and so for some people that can really bother their gut um so just making sure that it's not something that's making someone feel worse when they take it um but it's it's definitely possible that it's doing this okay. marco we have so many questions to go and i know that um you must have a oh, yeah. so, or you're, you're already home so what i would ask is if if the listeners or the viewers were willing to send us their question and i were to forward them to you would you be able to answer them as best you could yeah are you okay yeah with that? and then have maybe to have that on a, a, an answer sheet or something yeah exactly so i'm going to suggest that the email that everyone received with the access in you can simply return that, use that email address and send your question in and I'll make sure to get it over to Marco. And we'll Wonderful. Okay, that's great. So this was amazing information. Um, I think that's all the time we have for now. I really, really appreciate you going well beyond the, the normal time frame. So if you missed any part of this conference, it will be replayed on msfocusradio.org and available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page or our YouTube page. Remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Our next teleconference is gonna to be Tuesday, September 14th at 3.30 Eastern time. And that's gonna be featuring Dr. Ben Thrower, who will be discussing vision and MS. Our sincere thanks to all of our attendees for your participation, and especially to Marco Vespignani who was kind enough to take time out of his busy schedule to share his information with us. Goodbye, everyone. And we certainly hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. Thank All you. Right. Take care.